Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. <laughs> Sorry, my voice is uh, dying on me there. <laughs> Today, my friends, I have the pleasure of introducing you to an amazing woman who has written a book of an amazing man. And you get to know more about him very, very soon. Many of you, many of my audience would know of the author Bryce Courtney, uh, and many may know of his wife, Christine Courtney. Today, we're going to speak about really a new memoir, Bryce Courtney, storyteller, and I want to read something out for you guys. In the end, if someone says, here lies Bryce Courtney, a storyteller, my life would have been worthwhile. Christine, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. It's a real treat and a real honor to be actually unboxing your story and a little bit of Bryce's as well. I think it is uh, Bryce is an Australian treasure as I'm sure you are as well. So uh, it is truly, truly uh, wonderful to have you here. I didn't read out all the other things you've done. You've got a Bachelor of Arts from the University of <coughs> Australian, sorry, the Australian National University, and you co- co-founded the Australian uh, Himalayan Expeditions. So you're a seasoned traveler yourself, I believe. Is I right? know, Matt, yes. <laughs> wow, that is that is amazing. And you you also said to me a moment ago that you're an, an accidental writer. You didn't really anticipate to write a new book, which we will dive into in, in just a moment. But before we do that, my very first question for you is, what does success look like for you? I think think success is really how your health is going, the quality of your relationships with friends and family. And I think finding that thing in life that makes you get up the morning and in the morning and go, let's go at it. You know, I think you're very lucky if you find that something, whether it's being on air like you are, or I discovered running a trekking company in the Himalayas when I was only 20 and Bryce later did when he followed his dream of becoming a writer. I think that's really that gives you a chance of, of really savouring life to the full. Do you think Bryce would have had the same version of success you do? Or did he? I think Bryce was probably always associated with, you know, fame and success, both in his advertising career in the late 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, and then, of course, with his writing career. But I think... For him, success always, he said his greatest achievement was having a family Um, and I think also becoming a storyteller, something he had told his family he was going to do from when he was a very small child. But he didn't get to do it until he was 52. Which I think is honestly crazy, the fact that he didn't get to do it until he was 52. But then when he turned 52, I believe his first book was The Power of One. Is that right? His practice book, originally called The Tadpole Angel, was became an international bestseller. And no one was more surprised than Bryce because he'd done quite a bit of research about best-selling authors. <laughs> he discovered that it was usually about their third or fourth book. And he always thought that he was very lucky that The Power of One was ever picked up. Um, but he was a man in a hurry, having started so late. And even very early on uh, in his teenage years, he used to tell the family that not only was he going to become a writer, he was going to become a world famous one. And he certainly did that. I believe the statistics are most Australians actually have one, at least one of Bryce's books in the house, which is to some extent remarkable. (laughs) It really is for a, you know, particularly for a writer that started so late. Um, but remember, Bryce had um, made it in the world of ad- advertising. Again, he fell into that by chance. Um, and he knew how to, how to sell, he knew how to market things, and he in some ways changed the face of how books were published and marketed in Australia. And he didn't want to be one of those writers that sit in the dark in a garret and 10 people read their book. He used to say, what's the point of writing a book? you know, if no one was going to read it. But I think it was also his personality. He had a wonderful empathy for people and he had a rare connection with his readers. I mean, many many writers don't have that. I mean, Bryce could tell you what they ate for breakfast, where they lived and, you know, he just had that kind of natural instinct which was, and he knew who he was writing to. He, he could describe his readers 
whom he was always very grateful for their loyalty. And he used to say the reader is always right. He regarded them as the fourth protagonist yeah. in his works. Was Bryce, you mentioned that it was sort of natural, his empathy and, and things like that. Do you do you know or recall the kind of age that he was when he sort of started developing more of that empathy towards others? I think it really came, I think it was nurtured because of his very tough upbringing and he had to have a lot of personal courage and had to have a lot of resilience to survive that and still keep hold of his dreams. And I think he'd seen a lot of hardship and suffering in his own family um, and in the growing up in South Africa in the late 30s, 40s, and oh, yeah. in, uh, later, you know, from the coming out of the Depression and the war. And I think he didn't have a life that was insulated from, from trouble. And I think he did, though, have a natural, you know, feeling for people. And then when his, his younger son, Damon, was desperately ill, um, I think that also nurtured in Bryce a tremendous amount of compassion and understanding that, you know, he may not have, of course, known had he not gone through this this tragedy where his son later died. But anyone that knew Bryce always said that he had an unfailing positivity, an unfailing generosity of spirit, and he was kind and decent. I mean, that's what I loved about him. What age was he when his son died? His son was 24. And how old was Bryce at the time? Uh, that was in 1993, wasn't it? So Bryce was born in 1933, so in his uh, 50s. Good old maths. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I, know it, I know it's not exactly easy, but what – did he ever tell you his reaction to losing his son? Like what actually happened? I think he said he felt – I had asked him, and he said firstly he felt a sense of overwhelming relief – that Damon's suffering was over and it really had got to the point where it was unbearable. Yeah. In other ways, even though you're you're anticipating and remember Damon had been ill from when he was a baby with he had uh, classic haemophilia and later through a contaminated blood transfusion he acquired HIV AIDS. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was expected. But even so, anyone who's had a loss of anyone that they're close to, it, it, it's always a terrible shock. And, and I think it's especially terrible when it's a young person and for someone to lose a child is is an unimaginable, char- unimaginable uh, catastrophe, which he never recovered from. And neither did the family. Life goes on. Um, and he it inspired him really to write April Fool's Day, as Damon had asked him to do. Um, but it nearly broke him. It was the hardest book he ever wrote, and his only work of um, non-fiction. But Bryce just had this incredible personal courage, and he dusted himself off and got on with his life, just as he asked me to do a few days before he passed away, when I said, oh, you know, darling, what am I going to do? I can't imagine life without you. And he said, darling, I want you to embrace the gift of life as I have. I think that is a special reminder embrace the gift of life as I have, even though someone like Bryce had, had been through quite a bit. I mean, I, I remember reading, am, am I correct in saying that he was um, he was born in South Africa and he was an Ill- illegitimate child? Is that right? As was his elder daughter, Rosemary. His mother um, had been having an affair with a man she later discovered was married and had six other children. Wow. So in those days, can you imagine, she was seen as a fallen woman and was really outcast and it was terribly difficult for her. She wasn't well either. She had bad nerves. She suffered a lot of ill health, got malaria, and uh, she had a stroke after Bryce was was born and emergency appendicitis and went on and on. And she was moving from place to place, getting a series of menial jobs um, and had to place children with friends or relatives or in and out of institutions. So Bryce suffered and his sister a lot of loneliness and abandonment, and these institutions were very bad places, dark places to be. What did Bryce want to be when he grew up? He, he said he wanted to be a writer. I mean, he said it's a miracle he ever ended up just kind of, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, but just sort of digging on the roads or something with what he'd come through. But he had he always took solace in reading 
his great hero was Dickens. Yeah. And he always, um, he took refuge in that. And all of his family, I discovered, were storytellers. His grandfather told stories. His mother wrote poetry. His two uncles wrote stories. And he had an inspiring teacher when he was at this posh boarding school he somehow managed to get into in Johannesburg when he was a teenager. And she really gave him a lot of hope. And he always said that the power, when he wrote The Power of One, that that was who he had in mind. That was Miss Bornstein who gave him the re- hope. He told him to always keep hope, keep his dreams alive and to always have hope in his heart. Mm. So he drew a lot of the inspiration for his novels from his life, essentially. Very much. And I think any writer does that. I mean, you have to draw on something, don't you, unless it's yeah. pure fantasy. And he said when he sat down to write The Power of One, he thought, well, I'll just write about what I know, growing up in Africa. And when I reread all of his novels when I was writing the book over an 18-month, two-year period of researching and writing it, and I realised even more how much of his own life he had put into his novels. But there were a whole lot of things I didn't know about Bryce. He was a very private person, and even his eldest son, Brett Courtney, said that he never talked about his life growing up in Africa, and uh, you may have read in some of the other interviews that I found a box of letters, mm. which I never knew existed, that he'd written with from childhood, and they were like a diary. I mean, they were, were the pure goal for this book, and it allowed me to write the book in Bryce's voice. And I've also woven in extracts from his novels into the book as well. I wanted it, the book to be in Bryce's voice, and I wanted it to be a real story, a story with heart and soul and guts. I mean, Bryce once said that whitewashing a family story isn't a story at all. And he also said that if you rattle any family cupboard, shake any family cupboard, sorry, it rattles like hell. What captivated you the most about Bryce? That he survived. Yeah. I mean, the letters showed that he nearly died as a baby in the hospital. He was bluish. He couldn't take milk. He was very sickly and the doctor had warned his mother that he may not survive. And then after leaving school, he went to work on a citrus farm, which, again, he'd never talked about, and he was spraying all these very toxic chemicals. Then he'd heard that there was good money to be made on the copper belt in northern Rhodesia, now it's Zambia. So he went up there and trained as a grizzly, laying explosives underground. He had a lot of accidents and near misses. Then one day something went wrong and he was nearly blown to pieces. I mean, really. And then on his own again, finally he had enough money to go and study journalism in London. That was very tough as well. I mean, it was only, that was 1956, only 10 years or so after the Second World War. London wasn't the chic, high-end city, you know, it is now. People were still rationing and there were bomb sites everywhere and he did it very tough and then he went on a boat to Australia, arrived arrived just carrying one suitcase with nothing. But he was in love. He'd met a beautiful Australian woman, Benita Solomon, in London. And Benita really was the one that gave him a big start in Australia and introduced him into the advertising industry where she had a great job as a a radio manager. And what do you think made Bryce a a great advertiser when he did get a job? He was a great raconteur, like his father, who was called the raconteur of Natal. And he used to say that every ad was a story and it was a great ad great training ground for writing and also you had to have a deadline and I think you know he was never someone that felt sorry for the life he'd had the tough start he said what wonderful material it gave me for my books did he did he ever complain much no he wasn't someone who whinged he'd sometimes get a bit put out if he got a savage review from the critics which happened pretty often Yep. Because he used to think, you know, the readers love me. I can't write any better than I'm writing. And yet I get panned pretty often. And it, it sort of shrug it off, but I think it hurt him a bit. I mean, he got a wonderful award after he died, the Lloyd O'Neill Award by the advertis- uh, the writing industry, publishing industry. And I thought, why didn't they give it to him, you know, oh, yeah, while he was alive? Um, but he was someone who could pick himself up and keep on going. I mean, even when he got a terminal diagnosis in 2012, and he had stage four cancer diagnosed in 2010, late 2010, 
he wrote another book. <laughs> what a way to pass the time. Yep, he was hardwired. I mean, to be honest, I begged him not to finish Jack of Diamonds. He was so unwell, so tired. But he said, I've promised my readers I'd finish this book. I've promised, pr- promised my publisher and finish it, he did. And then he started writing some short stories that he didn't think would be published, which I must say he really enjoyed writing. He was writing just for the joy of writing in the last weeks of his life, and that was later published in a lovely little book called The Silver Moon. Mm. He's a special man. He really is. And I remember hearing about his passing, and even though I wasn't like a major, major fan of his of his work, I knew who he was. Yeah. And hearing about his passing was really, really sad because he's an icon. Yeah. He's an Australian writing icon, and losing a a treasure like that, and knowing that no new works are going to come from it. Yeah. It's it's hard. It's it's sad, but I think the legacy of Bryce lives on through his writing. And through a lot of young people discovering his writings now and then now coming on board and loving them, which I think is a true testament to his ability to tell stories in the way that he did. And he's he's so good at it. It's like it's hard, it's hard to put down a book when you start, honestly. And he thought his two best books were probably White Thorn, which he said was his most autobiographical work. And for fires, but you know, it is astonishing today that there are still sixty thousand followers on the Bryce Courtney Facebook page, and their heart aches every Christmas that there isn't a new Bryce Courtney novel under the Christmas tree. And Bryce used to say with pride, "I belong with the socks and the chocolates under the Christmas tree." But it's been so lovely that this year people have been saying they will have another book to put under the Christmas tree. And Bryce Courtney, storyteller, my love story to Bryce. But I do understand that a lot of people might think, well, she's never written a book before and, you know, stories written written by wives are not going to be any good. But Penguin Random House, they loved it from the moment I sent them a synopsis in a couple of chapters, very reluctantly, I might add. And my wonderful editor loves it and thinks it's one, one of the best biographies she's ever written, read, read written. Uh, and... Um, I feel very honoured, you know, that they feel that way and I'm getting so much feedback now from readers saying they can't put it, put it down and that like Bryce's books, you know, it's a bucket full of tears and a belly full of, full of laughs. But I don't think it was always that good. When I first submitted it on February 8th this year, I knew that I could make it better and I also kept uncovering more and more material. So I was researching, writing, researching. It's a far better book than the original one that I submitted and having Rachel Scully as my editor was fantastic. She really elevated the book and it's, uh, when I look at it now, I think, you know, it's a damn good read and I hope your listeners feel the same. I mean, I I got it not long ago and I started reading the first couple of pages and you're right, the way you captivate me straight away with the first couple of pages, you start off pretty much with a bang. <laughs> like it, 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 you, you start talking about Bryce almost immediately and it moved me. So I can't wait to actually dive further in and finish it. And I apologize for not finishing it before this interview, but uh, that's just my my honesty and, and the busyness of life. But I promise I will get to it. Um, there's there's a, a few questions that I did want to ask you about your relationship with Bryce. And, and the first one is, how did you meet him? I met him at a meeting of an organisation, little organisation called Writer's Block, which was made up of former advertising execs who decided to stop selling baked beans and to start writing novels. Um, People like Derek Hansen and uh, Jeff Gold. And I turned up because I had sold my venture travel company and I was had a marketing company and I worked on expeditions as well. And I used to sometimes tour authors, best-selling authors, Oh. And I thought, well, if I go along to this, they might want to hire me as, to do some marketing and publicity for them. And that's what happened. Bryce, a couple of years later, said he'd like me to be his full-time publicist. He did have one at Read Books where he was then, but they only used to do publicity pretty much when a book came out. And he said, I want to be out and about every day. And that's what I did. And then I moved out of Sydney, but I sort of kept in touch. Um, and then 
in 2005, I had become divorced from my marriage and um, Bryce was writing White Thorn then. I used to go over and sit down with him over lunch and have a cup of tea or a drink sometimes in the evening. And then out of the blue, believe me, it was out of the blue, he said, you know, Christine G, you and I would go very well together. <laughs> I nearly fell off my chair. I thought it was uh, not a good idea and I thought nothing would ever come of it and I was very apprehensive. Uh, and I wasn't really in an emotional state anyway to even think about it, but Bryce was a man who knew how to get what he wanted and he he spoiled me and indulged me and chased me from one end of Sydney to the other and I began to slowly surrender and he used to say lovely things like, darling, when you're young, you know, you fall into bed and you think you're in love, you know, but when you're older, well, you fall in like and then you fall in love. And he was true. He was right. That's what happened. How long did it take you to fall from being like and then to being in love? I think a good six months. And when I moved in to live with Bryce on Christmas Day 2005, I was very apprehensive. And But over the, the following months, that's when I began to think, yes, there's something stirring in me that's very profound and very special. And then I did fall totally, completely head over heels in love. And he wrote about some of that in some of his works, actually, like the Persimmon Tree that he was started to write in 2007. He said he had me in mind sometimes when he was writing some of those sloppy, corny things in that book. Um, but, you know, it was an adjustment. You know, he was he was famous. I wasn't used to being with someone who was famous. He was a lot older than me. Um and, you know, it was something that I really wanted to think about. Um, but I must say I'm so glad I did. It was an extraordinary experience being with Bryce. He was so kind and generous and so so wonderful to everybody. I mean, he helped so many organisations. He never said no to giving a talk. He used to auction characters in books to raise money for charity. He'd stand up, you know, if the government wanted to put a tax on books. He signed the sorry Book. I mean, he was into everything and just had this insatiable appetite for life. And I think he taught me how to write. I mean, I watched him work his way out of a book each year. I went to many of his writing courses, sat in on them, participated in them. I produced a book about his last writing course in 2012. And I used to listen to him talking about how when you write, you had to make it entertaining, that he used to say words just jump up at down with excitement if you use them properly and that words are essentially emotional creatures. He talked about the importance of dialogue. You'll find in my book there's a lot of dialogue. It isn't just me psycholo psychologising about Bryce, who he was. I let the letters, interviews, anecdotes from friends and family tell the story of, of Bryce Courtney, which is the first memoir of his life. And obviously I was in a very unique position to write it, particularly about our years together. And once I found the letters and I talked to a lot of friends and family and colleagues, I had enough material to cover those years when we worked together. And, did and you... also, sorry, I'd also spent time with his sister, Rosemary, in 2006, and she had talked a lot about their childhood as well, and she wrote about it. Yeah. Did you, did you know that you would time it perfectly well with the anniversary of his passing? Not really. I mean, the publisher, of course, had that idea. Um, in April 2020, I was actually writing a memoir of my own little life called Annapurna Sunrise, which mm. was about the founding of Australian Himalayan expeditions. And then I wrote a chapter called Our First Chapter about how Bryce and I met really as a writing exercise. And a girlfriend they said, this is really good. You should keep writing about you and Bryce. But once I submitted the manuscript um, and someone who'd been with Bryce in publishing had urged me to do that, um, I felt slightly panic-stricken. But then, of course, the publisher said, well, what better way to commemorate the 10th year of Bryce passing than to have your memoir published? So this is my love story to Bryce. This is my tribute to his remarkable life and literary legacy. Did you feel any pressure? to write a book like this? 
I did because not some months after he died, the CEO of Ping and Random House came up to Sydney and she um, sat me down and asked me to write the biography and I rejected it out of hand because I said out of respect for Bryce. He didn't write one. He desperately didn't want one written. He said that. We all asked him to write it and he said, no, 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 I want to be remembered for my works just as Dickens has said mm. the same thing. So I felt, you know, well, why do something that someone didn't want? Then a very good friend of his in South Africa, Alex Van Heeren, said to me, Christine, it's nearly 10 years. In the fullness of time, I think Bryce would say, now it is okay, now it is time, your story is written. And he would be over the moon that it was you who wrote it. He knew you'd be capable of it. I mean, he'd seen me write a few things before I'd written travel stories and I'd written chapters in books that he always thought, this isn't too bad. He said to me once, you should keep writing, darling. And then he'd say in the next breath, but one writer in the family is probably enough. <laughs> That's true. He was a full-time job, let me tell you. <laughs> it sounds like it. Uh, what did you love the most about Bryce? His kindness, his sense of decency. He used to say that wisdom is not about success. It's not about having things. It's about being decent and just how he would reach out to people and put himself out and actually do something to help people, give them money, books, sit for hours and always try to have them feel they could realise their dreams. And I hope in a small way that reading Bryce Courtney's Storyteller will have people feel they too can follow their dreams, whether it's a small dream, doing better on the golf course or writing a book or doing running a marathon or how they raise their children. I just hope it will inspire them to follow the dreams. I mean, my dream became completing this book. It nearly killed me, I have to tell you. But I did it and I look at it now and I almost can't believe it. So my dream came true to write a memoir of my late husband's life. I know writing a book is no easy feat. I mean, I released my first one this year too. Congratulations. Thank you. It was, yeah, one of those things where (laughs) I thought it'd be fun, (laughs) A, a lot more fun than what it actually was, but it was it was hard, but I'm glad that I did get to finish it. And congratulations on finishing this book. I have, you know, I know that it's going to touch many, many hearts and lives. And and I'm saying that as it already is, right? And and I know just hearing about Bryce's story, it interests me so much. So once again, I can't wait to dive into it. Thank you. Well, I can't wait to read yours. <laughs> oh, you. mine, mine's not going to be as good, trust me. <laughs> Mine, mine's not as interesting as Bryce's. Um, but thank you. Thank you for saying that. This photo, when was it taken and why did you include it on the back? It was taken in our garden in February 2012 by an incredible photographer in Sydney called Tim Bauer. And he also took the extraordinary front cover picture. And we were sitting outside in the garden and Tim was there for several hours. He must have taken thousands of shots. And when I look at them, I just think, wow, they were the only photos that Bryce would have wanted on the front cover and the back cover of the book. And I feel a debt of gratitude to Tim. And I think he just captured the essence of our love our story. And remember, when that was taken, Bryce was very unwell. Yeah. He looked fabulous. He looked like a teenager. He looks very happy. We were just, there was a radiance, you know, to us. I mean, not that any relationship is always easy. You have your ups and downs. But Bryce never sweated the small stuff, and he taught me not to do that. He said if I was being annoying or he felt upset with me, He'd think, is it worth having a blue about? And he'd think, no, it never was. Uh, if I was getting, you know, neurotic or out carrying on about something, he'd say, oh, darling, let's go outside in the garden, have a cup of coffee or take Timmy for a walk or what's the next holiday you're dreaming up? Where are you going to next? And I'd say, oh, I'd like to go to Galapagos or I'd like to go back to Antarctica or it's time I went back to Everest again. And, you know, he would just have me in stitches. So... That was Bryce. I mean, he he was just a darling and um, it was just 
the greatest blessing of my life that that I was with him. How long after those photos were taken did he pass? It was in February and he died on November 22nd, 2012 at 11.30 p.m. at home in Canberra with four cats on the bed and Timmy the dog at his feet and myself and one of his sons as well at his bedside. What's it like because you're in the room, if you're able to describe what is it like to watch someone basically pass away? I've never experienced it before and I wouldn't like to again. Having said that, I'm so grateful that I was with Bryce because he wasn't alone and in so many ways it was a very profound experience because he started to sort of feel a bit cold at his extremities and we'd been told by the doctors and the palliative nurses that he didn't have long and I called out to Bryce's son Adam and I said, I think something's changing and he just started to go much colder and and then he, to my astonishment, because he'd sort of been unconscious pretty much for a couple of days, hadn't spoken, he opened his beautiful blue eyes, he stared straight at us then they rolled back in his head and he was gone. And uh, then you feel this sense of, I think, shock and overwhelming grief, but it's over and they're gone. They're gone forever. And well, what were his final words to you? Honestly, I can't remember, but I think he said a number of very poignant things in those last couple of days when he was speaking he talked a lot about his childhood he asked me to write all this stuff down darling get a pen get a pen he talked a lot about his childhood it was as though he wanted to settle a lot of scores settle a lot of things have it written down make sure that I I knew everything he told me too much sometimes <laughs> um and I said darling it's all right I didn't have to know that um but we he want we talked about our wedding and our love and I did ask him if he was afraid. I said, do you ever worry where you're going, what's going to happen? He wasn't religious. I think he took got his spirituality from his gardening and probably rugby. And he said, no, I know I'm not afraid. I know just exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to return to the earth just as it should be and I'll turn into humus and things will grow from me. Plants will rise and they'll reach for the sky and that's just as it should be. And it's all going to be wonderful. How brave is that? It is brave because when you would walk out into your garden, I can imagine Bryce, you know, he's there. Yeah. And he said it was a very strange feeling, putting plants, growing vegetables, knowing that he wouldn't see them come into bloom. And each year I still plant sunflowers just as he asked all his readers to do because he always thought they were a plant that was a symbol of hope and sunshine and happiness and fun. Yeah. Bryce was so much fun. And you could, he wanted everybody to seize whatever little moment of happiness there was in life. And I saw recently that Richard E. Grant just put out a memoir called A Pocket yeah. Full of Happiness. And I thought that was such a lovely saying to seize that little moment in the day, whatever's going on. I had to go and have a very routine test at a hospital this morning. You walk in and you see very ill people and you walk out and you think, wow, what am I going to do today that is going to be enjoyable and happy and really health is wealth? And um, I just wish Bryce had had more time, but mercifully he didn't get blown up in the mines. He didn't die of that fruit fly poisoning you know, when he was a teenager, um, he got to 79. His mother got to nearly 94. He always thought he'd live wow. a long life. Um, but it was a life well lived and he had no regrets. And he died peacefully with those that he loved yeah. by his side. And I think that is a beautiful testament really to a a man that, yeah, he served and he, and he did a lot for, for a lot of people. Um and you mentioned the pocket full of happiness. I was listening to uh, Richard E. Grant on a friend of mine's podcast recently talking about that book. It was actually his daughter, I believe, that mentioned that phrase. Mm. He would have a pocket full of happiness after the passing of his wife. Mm. And just hearing him describe it 
was uh, it's a profound moment, I think, being able to listen to you. Yeah, it's special for me, believe it or not. So thank you for, for sharing everything that you, you have with me and for allowing me to, to unbox a little bit of it. I've got two quick final questions for you, Christine, if that's all right with you. Uh, where do you want people to get a copy of the book? I know it's at local bookstores in Australia, but is it coming out in the US too? No, it's not. It's it's available in New Zealand and people can buy it if they live abroad on Book Depository. They ship free worldwide. The cheapest copies seem to be available now at Kmart or Big W and also people can get an audio version or an ebook, and it's, it's available in libraries as well. They've been buying it in. I saw you, um, uh, I think it was a video of you reading the book and I know how hard it is to actually read an audio book. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, you've done it, have you? Yeah. Well done. You, you you sat in the chair. How many hours did it take you? Well, it's. I think it, this, the book runs for about 18 hours, but they taped it for about 58 hours. It went on for days and days three in three-hour blocks, as you've probably done. And it was very funny when I finished it, my brother Bruce, who lives in Melbourne, said, well, if you think I'm listening to you for 18 hours, you can forget it. <laughs> but the readers are saying they've liked it, listening to my husky voice. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same sort of feeling when I recorded mine. I'm like, no way is anyone going to listen to my voice. And then they're like, Jay, you got a podcast for goodness sake. People are listening to you all, all the time. So what's yeah. the difference with the book? <laughs> exactly. I tell you what, though. Really recite it. I mean, I could nearly recite mine. And Almost, yeah, yeah. I it mean, was quite nice to read it because I thought, God, it really is finished. You can't change a comma. I found five typos, which is very annoying, um, and they'll be changed for the next edition. But it's a feeling of kind of closure, isn't it? And in a way, I can hear Bryce saying to me, "Now, darling, it's ten years. You've written the memoir. You put that book on the shelf." And you get on with your life. Yeah. It's it's funny how you mentioned the typos because, yeah, I found typos in my book too. And I'm like, come on. Of all the things, like I thought, you know what, not going to get typos, but I did. So it, it's comforting to know that even yourself have typos in your book and even some of the best authors out there do as well. So you, no, no one's perfect at the end of the day. But uh, Christine, my final question for you, this is my all-time favorite question. I want to ask it to you in particular. Not, but it's not I know Bryce can't answer this, but um, it's a hypothetical one. But I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done, don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Wow. What an honour that would be. <laughs> what I would like it to say is, and especially for women, I think, growing up in my generation when the women's rights movement was just really emerging, just to hold tight to your dreams, to dig deep and find the mental toughness you need to make them come to fruition. And even if you fall sometimes, get up again and dig really deep because you will find the strength you need and surround yourself with people that share your values, that are kind to you and Whenever you feel like any temptation not to do the right thing, always do the right thing, always do the decent thing and help other people in small ways or big ways. That is the gift of giving. And I think that's the secret of a happy life, to help and support others, to be kind and decent. And when you can, have fun. That is a beautiful send-off message for people to think about going about their days. Christine, thank you so much for your time today, your wisdom, your advice, and your stories about yourself and Bryce. It's been an absolute treat. So thank you so much for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. I've absolutely loved it. And I have to tell you quite honestly, it's the most insightful and thoughtful interview I've had for the book. And I'm I loved it. 
truly.